Father, I want to thank you that you've endowed us with your spirit to teach us. And Lord, both in the speaking and the hearing, may you do the communicating. And Jesus said, you, you said you're the teacher. And so we count on you to do just that. And we thank you for your presence here this evening. And we pray this with thanksgiving in your name. Amen. We are going to start in Joshua chapter 3 this evening. And if you'd turn there, that's where I'm going to start in verse 1. And on our outline this morning, we were talking about uh, desperation and how Israel spent 40 years in the wilderness uh, learning dependence upon God. And it says that God humbled them. He actually let them go hungry uh, so that he might do them good in the end. And that's what precedes this event coming up to Joshua chapter 3 at the border of Canaan. And we could sum up what we learned in the last session by saying this. When I can't, I'll discover he can. When I can't, I'll discover that he can. But that is often the prerequisite for coming into a personal appreciation and experience of the indwelling life of Christ. In the Old Testament, God's sufficiency was expressed in Canaan. In the New Testament, God's sufficiency is expressed in Christ. In the Old Testament, God gave his people the land of Canaan. In the New Testament, God gives his people the indwelling life of Christ. In the Old Testament, the receiving was external. In the New Testament, the receiving is internal. And as somebody who has been born again by the Spirit of God, I can know that when I received Christ, I received Christ into my being. And he came to live in me through the miracle of the Holy Spirit in new birth. And what we're talking about in Joshua chapter 3 is really... What, how, what is our responsibility so that the presence of Christ becomes the reality of Christ in my life, so that his presence becomes powerful, so that this doesn't just remain theory but becomes reality? What is included in that? We talked about desperation this morning. This evening, in this first session, we're going to talk about revelation and separation. Revelation and and separation. Let's read Joshua chapter 3 and verses 1 to 4. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and he and all the sons of Israel set out and came to the Jordan, and they lodged there before they crossed. At the end of three days, the officers went through the midst of the camp, and they commanded the people, saying, When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God with the Levitical priests carrying it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. However, there shall be between you and it a distance of about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near to it, that you may know the way which you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. The Christian life is lived from the inside out. It begins with attitudes that blossom into actions. It begins with dispositions that blossom into decisions. And, and when we reckon with the presence of Christ, in utter dependence upon him through our repentance and faith, he begins to reproduce the character of Christ and that character is then revealed in our actions towards other people. So that other people meet a Christian and they come to know what Christ is like. And as somebody said, really a Christian is sometimes the only Bible a person is ever going to read. And sometimes I think it's a very good one. Here it speaks in Joshua chapter 3 and verses 1 to 4 about the Ark of the Covenant. And the interesting thing about the Ark of the Covenant is that, that it appears or is mentioned 15 times in chapters 3 and 4. 15 times there is mention of the Ark of the Covenant in, as, as they crossed the Jordan. The Ark of the Covenant is the sign of God's presence in his people. And 
God said that you are to keep a distance between you and it of 2,000 cubits. 2,000 cubits is about a kilometer, and the Jews took that as the measurement or the limit for a Sabbath day journey. So if you read about that in the Gospel accounts, it was a Sabbath day journey away. It was 2,000 cubits, and that goes back to this event. So God said, I want you to keep a distance between you and me so that you might see where I'm going. And he said, you need to keep that distance and allow me to lead you because you have never been this way before. This is going to be something completely new. Nehemiah spoke about this epic when he said in Nehemiah 9 and verse 20, he said, you gave your good spirit to instruct them. Jesus said of the Holy Spirit in John 16, 13, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you or lead you into all the truth. And so if I'm going to come into an appreciation of the power and the sufficiency and the reality of Christ's indwelling life, the Spirit of God is going to have to reveal that to me. Man teaches by communicating information. God teaches by communicating revelation. Information communicates facts. Revelation communicates reality. And so if, if this is going to be taught and it's going to become real in my experience. It's going to be the Spirit of God who is going to make this real and show me this. I, I, I wrote a prayer up here or referred to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And I'm going to read verses 17 to 19. And I, I, I like the prayers of Paul in the New Testament. I'm not the brightest bulb on the Christmas tree, but it only makes sense to me that if, if a prayer is contained in the scriptures, it certainly reveals God's will for his people. Otherwise, it wouldn't be there. And so we actually have six prayers of Paul scattered throughout his letters. And, and we have this one in Ephesians chapter 1. And this is the prayer for somebody who's seated here and they're saying to themselves, Peter, this makes sense. It all sounds good. But I just, how does this become real? One of the most practical things you can do is pray this prayer. Let me read it for you in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 17. Paul says he is praying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe. So if, if you... If you say, this sounds so good, it sounds true, but how does it become real? Or I'm still confused. What's my responsibility and what's his? Pray this prayer. We all can do that. Pray, Lord, give me a spirit of wisdom and of revelation and knowledge of you. By your spirit, let my eyes see this. Let me have one of those spiritual, aha, I get it experiences. We can pray this prayer with confidence because of what 1 John 5.14 says, and it says there, this is the confidence that we have before him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So he's certainly going to answer that prayer. So we would do ourselves a favor to pray that prayer. Pray Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 17 through 19. It was certainly God's will for Israel to enter into the land of Canaan. It is certainly God's will for his people today to enter into the reality of Christ's indwelling life. It was certainly his will for both. And so if this is not yet clear, keep praying, keep praying, keep praying that God would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ's indwelling life. 
I want to move on and I want to talk about separation. About separation. In other words, you, you could use it for this is, is the word holiness, being holy. I think sometimes we use the word consecration or sanctification. But, but Joshua said this in Joshua 3, verses 5 and 6. Then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua spoke to the priests, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over ahead of the people. And so they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went ahead of the people. We're going to look at a verse later on in Romans chapter 12. And uh, verse 2, it talks about presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. There's a passage in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14 that says, pursue peace with all men and the sanctification or the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Here's the deal about Jordan. Jordan formed the border between Canaan and the wilderness. And if Israel was going to enter into the sufficiency of Canaan, they were going to have to leave the wilderness behind. There is a border between the two. In other words, you can't keep the wilderness and enter into Canaan. It is, it is a, it's a new life. And there's a border between the two. And so he says, you consecrate yourselves. Uh, you make yourselves holy, as it were, because you cannot bring wilderness living into Canaan. This is the border. I know for me, and I mentioned this already this morning, I lived so long with this, this philosophy of dedication, try harder, failure, shame, disappointment, forgiveness, more dedication. More trying harder, harder, more failure, more shame, more disappointment, more forgiveness. And, and pretty soon you get into that routine. And for me, I settled with the peace of defeat. I settled for, for a quality of Christian experience uh, that I said, there's nothing better than this. God brings his people to the border of, of Canaan, and he's about to bring them into something much, much better than the wilderness. But you've got to leave the wilderness behind and everything that the wilderness includes. And sometimes our disappointment with the Christian life is actually our disappointment with ourselves. And our disappointment with ourselves is proof that we've been trusting ourselves to live the Christian life. And, and when our trust rests on us and not him, this sense of disappointment that we think is God's disappointment with us is actually my disappointment with myself. And, and then it turns into this self-condemnation, and that self-condemnation, quite honestly, is rooted in our self-righteousness. We think we can do it. During these three days, Joshua asked, asked the people to separate themselves to the Lord. They were not to come up with a plan how to, to build a bridge across the Jordan. That was not what he asked them to do. Because all that the wilderness experience was to teach them was that I can't. So he didn't say, stay here and build a bridge. Stay here and separate yourselves to me. Don't come up with plan B, but you're going to leave the wilderness behind right now. In, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, let me read this passage uh, for us this evening. Deuteronomy 7, verses 3 to 6. It says, when the Lord your God delivered the, delivers them before you and you defeat them, then you shall utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them and show no favor to them. Furthermore, you shall not intermarry with them. You shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor shall you take their daughters for your sons. For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. And then the Lord's anger 
will be kindled against you, and he will quickly destroy you. But thus you shall do to them, you shall tear down their altars, smash their sacred pillars, hew down their ashram, and burn their graven images with fire. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. God said, when you move into Canaan, you're going to be a holy people to me. And if you would enjoy what Canaan offers, it is going to place the demands of holiness upon you and me. If we would enjoy the reality and the sufficiency and the unspeakable joy of Christ's indwelling life, it is going to place demands of holiness upon you and upon me. And we're going to have to separate ourselves from things, but only because we're separating, our, separating ourselves to Christ. Uh, I would put it this way. Dedication is separating ourselves from something. Sanctification or separation is setting ourselves apart to somebody. And there's a difference between the two. Um, you can separate yourself from a lot of things in this world and, and supposedly keep yourself clean without ever separating yourself to Christ. That's the key. Will we have to separate ourselves from some things? Yes, we will, but we only do that in order to be separated to him. Uh, on March 27th, 2004, Gabby and I stood at the altar of a church in our neighborhood in Mansell, and uh, Pfarrer Gerhard Hegel did the ceremony. And um, it was a little bit like a torchbearer reunion. It was really fun, and we enjoyed it a lot. And we got to that point in the service, and uh, Pfarrer Hegel asked me, Peter, do you take Gabby to be your wife? And in German, I said, Ja, mit Gottes Hilfe. Yes, with the help of God. At the moment I said yes to Gabi, I said no to every other woman in this world. It's that simple. In saying yes to one, I automatically said no to all others. When I said yes to Christ, I said no to every other idol that could rule in my heart. We'll talk about idolatry when we come to uh, Achan or, or later in this week. But to say yes to Christ is to say no to a lot of other lovers. James, he, he, he put it this way in James chapter 4 and verses 4 to 8. He said, you adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you not know that the scripture speaks to no purpose? Or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit that he made to dwell in us. Another translation of that says, the spirit whom he has made to dwell in us jealously desires us. But he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. When Scripture says and speaks about the jealousy of God, God is not jealous of us as if we had something he didn't have because everything that I have and he has given me ability to obtain belongs to him. God is not jealous of me as in the sense that I have something he doesn't, but he is jealous for me. He's jealous for me. And Jealousy is really desiring something so strongly that you won't, com you you won't tolerate competition. Uh, jealousy is an expression of the strength of love. 
And in Exodus chapter 34 and verse 14, it says that God's name is jealous because his love is so pure, so strong, so untainted that he cannot tolerate competition in my heart. And it moves him to express his jealousy in an act of love. And again, this is going to, uh, to include a certain amount of intolerance. Um, one plus one equals two, and not the number three. It's not that I don't have something against the number three, as if I consider the number three the enemy of mathematics in that equation. It's just that the truth will not accommodate another answer. Truth is intolerant. And there is a, 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 a place for righteous intolerance in the kingdom of God. I personally want to go on record in saying this. We cannot tolerate unrighteous intolerance. That, that's not what the Bible teaches. But there is a place for a righteous intolerance that is embedded in love. And it's interesting in the fields of science, in the fields of finance, in the fields of physics and manufacturing, we will not tolerate compromise. Bless you. <laughs> I, I think that was amen. <laughs> you know, we don't tolerate compromise in those areas. And yet when we quote Jesus in John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. All of a sudden, that person is considered dangerous. Uh, we're not quoting that. Jesus, or, or We haven't made that up. Jesus said that. But, but as soon as somebody insists on something being the truth in spiritual matters, all of a sudden, they, they experience a lot of opposition. When I was a young staff member at Bodensehof, uh, part of my responsibility, because we had a wood-burning wood furnace, was to collect a lot of wood, kind of you know, like Ray does. I mean, you have piles of woods here. We had something similar. And one day, I borrowed a, a, a small um, uh, truck from, from a local carpenter. And uh, he was going to allow us to go into the woods with that. And he said, go ahead, just uh, fill it up, and then, and then bring it back. That'll be just fine. So I went to the gas station. I fill it up. And I get in the driver's seat, and I turn the key, and it wouldn't start. And uh, it was really embarrassing because, you know, other people are trying to get in, fill their tanks. And luckily, the guy lived just a block away. So I run over to his house and I said, you know, something's wrong with your truck. And he came over and looked at the truck and looked where I had parked it. And he said, what did you fill the tank with? I said, gas. And then he turned white and he said, this is a diesel engine. And a diesel engine will not tolerate gas. It was really embarrassing. You only make that mistake once in my neighborhood. But that engine was intolerant. We, we accept intolerance in other fields of life. And to become separate uh, to Christ and, and to not tolerate something that would stand between him and me. That's part of living in Canaan. If I came back from a ministry engagement and I, I walked into the door in Ziegelstraße 10, that's where I live in Fischbach, and I walked in and I said, hi, Schatz, I'm home. And I walk into the kitchen, she's not there. And I walk into the living room and she's not there. I walk into the, you know, our, our, our office and She's not there, and this is very unusual because she's usually waiting for me when I come in the door, and I go upstairs, I open up the bedroom door, and she's lying in bed with another man. If my reaction was, oh, do sorry, uh, I'll just wait. If that was my reaction, you would have reason to doubt my love for my wife not just her love for me. Love wouldn't tolerate that. So when I tolerate other lovers in my heart, 
when I allow something to take such a place in my heart of hearts, and Jesus comes with the conviction of his loving spirit, that is a sign of his love. If he didn't do that, it would be a sign that he didn't love me, as the scripture claims. Of course he's going to say something. Of course he's going to bring conviction on me. The spirit that has been made to dwell in you and me jealously desires us. Therefore, it says he gives a greater grace. God is opposed to the proud, gives grace to the humble. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Honestly, sometimes I am not experiencing the power of the Spirit in my life because I'm double-minded. You see, my danger is not that I'm going to wake up tomorrow morning and just flat out say no to Jesus and try and walk away. The danger is that I'm going to wake up tomorrow and say yes to Jesus and then want to say yes in my heart to another lover. It doesn't work that way. And we need to reconcile ourselves to the fact that there are irreconcilable differences in the kingdom of God. Scripture speaks of light and the darkness. Scripture see, speaks of holiness and sin. Scripture speaks of, of sheep and goats, heaven and hell. And there are things that just can't mix. I don't know if you've ever considered this or not, but the spirit who has been made to dwell within you and me is called the Holy Spirit. And he is separated to the will, to the character, to the power of Christ himself. And Jesus says his job will be to take of mine and reveal it to you. His job will be to make me uh, real in you by his own presence. Sometimes, honestly, I fear leaving the wilderness because I've lived there so long, I wouldn't know anything different. Do you know, we're, 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 we're creatures of habit. I remember, you know, when I walk into the, the dining hall and, and uh, Taylor picked me up, I, I've, it was so good to be able to sit somebody, with somebody at the table. So good that I knew somebody. When the, the uh, you know, Bible school begins at the beginning of the year, I'm looking for one of my friend's sons or daughters. Just get, I, I need to be something that's familiar to me because of my fear of being alone. And sometimes we're staying in the wilderness out of fear because we can't imagine that there's going to be something better that, that, that would allow us to move on from that. And so we're remaining where we are out of, out of fear. That's not a good place to be. Again, this is something that Israel had never entered before. This was going to be something totally new for them. You've never been this way before. But I want you to separate yourself to me. If you'd look up here, this is a very simple illustration, but um, this is a holy shoe. That one too. It's separated to this foot. And wherever my foot goes, my shoe goes to the same place. It's a very good deal. <laughs> and the only explanation for the place of my shoe is my foot. That's how holiness works. You can, you can separate a shoe, you know, and, and it can be separate from all the other shoes here, but if it's not separated to my foot, it's not serving a good purpose. It might be isolated from the other big bad shoes in this room, but it's not serving any good until my foot indwells the shoe. Now, you need to know, and you can probably be thankful that you have a little distance from my shoe, because um, probably it doesn't smell the best and it's been walking outside, you know, on the loop. It's probably walked through some sheep uh, droppings. I think that would be an appropriate public word. Uh, and, and so 
my shoe is not a perfect shoe, but it is separate. And holiness speaks more of separation in my case, not perfection. And people say, how can we be holy? I could never be holy. Well, holiness in our case is not referring to perfection. It is referring to separation. In all my weakness, yes, in all my imperfection, I separate myself to Christ. Romans chapter 12, actually verse 1, I quoted that wrong earlier. Paul said, therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. I have taken Jesus, who has lived within me since I was 13 years old, to places where he doesn't belong. I've taken my eyes and looked at things that Jesus would never look at. I've involved my body in things that Jesus would never do. And that's a bad advertisement for Jesus. You can't keep the wilderness and enjoy Canaan. There's a separation between the two. And when I enter into Canaan, it's going to mean that I live in this continual renewal of holiness. The great question in the Christian life is not, do I have all of Jesus? Because I do. The great question in the Christian life is this one. Does Jesus have all of me? A number of years ago, I read this piece in a um, small pamphlet. I didn't know who wrote it. I've since found out that it was written by a man named G.D. Watson, who is a Methodist minister based in Los Angeles back in the 1800s. It's called The High Calling. Let me read part of it. If God has called you to be really like Jesus in all your spirit, he will draw you into a life of crucifixion and humility and put on you such demands of obedience that he will not allow you to follow other Christians. And in many ways, he will seem to let other good people do things which he will not allow you to do. Others can brag on themselves, on their work, on their success, on their writings, but the Holy Spirit will not allow you to do any such thing. And if you begin it, he will lead you into some deep mortification that will make you despise yourself and all your good works. The Lord may let others be honored and put forward and keep you hid away in obscurity because he wants to produce some choice fragrant fruit for his coming glory, which can only be produced in the shade. God will let others be great, but keep you small. He will let others do work for him and get the credit for it. But he will make you work and toil without knowing how much you're doing, and then to make your work still more precious, he will let others get the credit for the work which you have done and this will make your reward 10 times greater when Jesus comes. The Holy Spirit will put a strict watch on you with a jealous love and rebuke you for little words and feelings or for wasting your time, which other Christians seem never distressed over. So make up your mind that God is an infinite sovereign and he has the right to do as he pleases with his own. And he will not explain to you a thousand things which may puzzle your reason in his dealings with you. God will take you at your word. And if you absolutely sell yourself to be his slave, he will wrap you up in a jealous love and let other people say and do many things that you cannot do and say. So settle it forever, that you are to deal directly with the Holy Spirit and that he is to have the privilege of tying your tongue or chaining your hand or closing your eyes in ways that others are not dealt with. 
Now, when you are so possessed with the living God that you are in your secret heart, pleased and delighted over this peculiar, personal, private, jealous guardianship and management of the Holy Spirit over your life, you will have found the vessel of heaven. And sometimes when we live in submission to Jesus and our lives are separated to him, that's going to mean that not everybody's going to come with us, but it will also mean that you enjoy a blessed holiness or a blessed loneliness because you know the sufficiency of Christ in your life. Pray, Lord, give me a heart and give me a spirit of, of wisdom and revelation. And come to him. Cleanse your hands. Purify your heart. And say to him, Lord, have all of me like I have all of you. Let's pause just for one minute and think about those things in silence. And then I'll close with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you that your love is stronger than death. I want to thank you that you do indeed make us aware of that which is coming between you and me. And Lord, I'd pray that you would encourage somebody with an impression of your love on their hearts so that they might not fear leaving something behind, even the thing that you've made them aware in these last few minutes. And I thank you for your incredible patience with us as we learn to be holy. Teach us these things, we pray in your name. Amen. Let's take a 10-minute break, and then we'll come back and uh, have the second session. I'll need a little bit more time for the second session for this first one. Thank you. <laughs>